Okay, this is our second section um, of Unit 10. Um, this is about Vietnam conflict, also some things with the counterculture. Um, very brief overview of it. I would love to go some deeper into the military side, my love of military history um, there, but this is not a military history class. So, so yeah, there will be pretty much one or two battles that you need to know. Uh, one, one general you have to know, but more of the vocabulary and the very broad ideas that you have. There'll also be things about Vietnam when we have our sections over Kennedy and Johnson, as well as the Nixon administration. Um, you'll see where for the state standards, uh, 614 is straight out about causes, course, and consequence of the Vietnam War. Our key bracketing date for this is 1968, but the, the thing about it is the Vietnam conflict is something that starts um, even back in the Truman time. So, very brief background of this. It was a French colony during World War II, the Japanese will take over after France is taken over by Germany, and you will have the Vietnamese fighting side by side with the Chinese with help from the United States against the Japanese on um, there. All of this area is called Indochina, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. Um, and when World War II ends, you will have it where the, the people of Vietnam are striving for their independence. They asked the United States even to help. Um, here and the United States is kind of caught um, in a, a rock in a hard place because the French are also help asking them to help make it a colony again. Now, very long story short, starting a little bit with Truman, more so with Eisenhower, we will be sending along the way these advisors um, here, and we will help out the French. We are later on in 1954. It's going to be divided up into um, North and South Vietnam. North Vietnam being led by Ho, Ho Chi Minh. Um, South Vietnam that is that is pro-capitalism so communism versus capitalism again obviously we're going to be supporting the South Vietnamese that are um, for for um, capitalism now the DM the person that, that we were helping in, the, in South Vietnam um, was seen as very corrupt um, you're gonna see on the next page where he's going to be actually even seen him going against freedom of religion um, that we have but he's against communism so we will end up helping him out along the way um, here. Again, very, very brief overview. We're giving it a lot of money. We're just sending these advisors to him. Again, I, uh, Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, um, Lyndon Johnson is continuing um, to do this. Why are we there? And that's a question you kind of have to ask the whole time. And this is what people were asking at that time was, we're there as part of the domino theory. We we're afraid that since China fell, that the next one was since it was North Vietnam, and we don't want South Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Burma, continue on. So this is where we need to stop this. So pretty much this is part of the original idea that Truman had with containment that president after president uh, is um, being a part of. Uh, mention that DM's government is very corrupt, is very unpopular. You see those pictures of the Buddhist monks that would douse, douse themselves with gasoline and set themselves on fire. Uh, this is where, they, I mean, it was not even allowed as much with the freedom of religion um, here. Ultimately, it makes it where we, we have to help and we assist in the assassination of DM um, there. Uh, ironically for JFK, he signs the, the warrant for doing this about a month before he himself is assassinated, which you see the picture on the bottom right there of him. Now. JFK is assassinated. Lyndon Johnson takes over. There's a lot of different theories that, uh, that are, are out there. Some saying that Kennedy was actually wanting to make more peace. This is where you have conspiracy theories even. Um, if you see the movie JFK, that this is where the military wanted LBJ to, to, to be president. But LBJ is president. Now, in 1964, we will have an incident for, uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin. We will have some ships, and I always put quotes around, around here because there are some people that will even claim that it was staged, that North Vietnam um, launched a, some, some shots at our, our ships um, there, but it was seen as an act of war. So Lyndon Johnson goes to Congress, he asks for combat forces. We do not declare war, okay, this is a key thing, this is not a declared war, our last declared war will be World War II. This is where I was saying it before about in World War II, that um, we're going to find some of the differences. Jane Fonda in this war will raise uh, money and help out the enemy, where if she did that in World War II, she would have been executed for treason. 
But the thing that I want you to notice is the vote for the House. Every single representative voted to do this, and all but two senators voted to give the president powers. And pretty much we give them wartime powers even though we don't declare war. That vote, we have less people opposing this than we had that were opposing declaring war after Pearl Harbor. So our our government was for this. Most people, they didn't even know what a Gulf of Tonkin was. So they did were for it. And nobody was really even thinking anything about it because, hey, it's halfway across the world. We've got the greatest military in the world uh, in there. And there's like these jokes about, all right, we're fighting a bunch of guys in black pajamas because the soldiers uh, that were fighting, some of them are North Vietnamese, but a lot of them are the Viet Cong. And it's not really an organization um, organized army as as well as what you would think. They are going to be doing guerrilla warfare uh, there. And, uh, and this is where it's not traditional type warfare that you normally think of. We're not going tanks against tanks uh, here. Now, this is where you have a lot of vocabulary words that you need to know. The first one is escalation because 64, 65 on up, we will keep sending more and more troops until we have over half a million in 1968. Um, here. The idea was, well, we'll overwhelm them with numbers. Then the other second idea was, well, we'll bomb the heck out of them um, there. And we will actually launch more tonnage of bombs in Vietnam than we will in World War II. But we're not striking cities. A lot of this area is jungle, small villages um, here. So the tonnage sent to it. By 1965, we'll have ground troops for the first time. General William Westmoreland is the person that's in charge. He really gets gets a uh, bad rap. I will tell you, he definitely had some flaws that he made as a military leader, but you have to give him a little bit of um, credit in the way that he had his hands tied behind his back. Um, there were, I have in the notes that he had fought a limited war. Um, he was not able to use all his resources. He had to worry a lot about the politics that, that we have. So I kind of say it'd be almost like if you got in a fight and you have one hand tied behind your back and your feet are tied where you can only move four inches at a time um, there. So he couldn't do everything. Our plan to win was a war of attrition. This is going to be ironic because our plan was to wear down the enemy and ultimately where, even though officially we didn't lose, yes, we can say that it was a loss that we were wore down and people got tired of fighting here. Um, search and destroy missions. What we are doing, we are looking for these guerrilla units that are out there. Um, this is where for, for Forrest Gump, where Forrest says he's looking for Charlie. That was the nickname of them. Um, Napalm and Agent Orange are two things that you need to be familiar with. We'll go more of them in the class, but Napalm, you see see there on the, the picture on the second one to the left. Uh, and this is where it is like a firebomb that is done, but it'll stick to, to people and, and then burn that you have. For Agent Orange, the, the picture that's the next one over where you see these giant planes that are they're just missed. And what it is is a herbicide. Um, and it goes down, since they're hiding in the jungle, we're going to kill the jungle. Unfortunately for us, we will have many of our soldiers that were exposed to this that we did not realize how bad it was until decades later. And still today, we have a lot of veterans that are fighting with the Veterans Administration where they have cancer that was caused by exposure to, to Agent Orange. And it's really a disservice to a lot of our veterans as they're trying to prove that they were exposed to it um, there before they get treatment um, for Agent Orange. But I know both of my first period class and second period class, there were um, students that had grandfathers that were right now dealing with things with, with Agent Orange and a student in my fourth period class that had a grandfather that recently died from cancer that the VA had said was from it. All right, the Hamlet program was not teaching them um, Shakespeare. The idea of the Hamlet program was to go and we were trying to root out these, these um, Viet Cong soldiers. And we will, we will go and sometimes even destroy villages um, there that, we, that people had lived in and we're trying to, to seek out and find this. Um, it was not a very smart plan because ultimately it'll give more and more and more support to the Viet Cong and more resentment against the Americans. Here's where you look at this graph and that idea that, that, that we have that where we kept on escalating in there. And you notice again where we peak in, in 1968, go back down, but over time, I mean, this was our former longest war, it no longer is. 1968 is a key year. Early on in the war, we will have the Tet Offensive. Um, Tet is uh, the, the um, New Year holiday. Um, I basically have been told that you kind of describe it, it'd be like if we would put Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's all together in at one time. 
In years past, usually the Viet Cong would kind of slip off, go and celebrate with their family. So the Americans put their, put their guard down some. And then the Viet Cong, along with the North Vietnamese, will both attack. And for a couple of days there, it did not look good for the Americans. We will win Viet Tet. I mean, officially we win. There were something like city, city, 70 cities that were attacked. We militarily will win all of the conventional battles on there. But what happened was, is this is where this became a war that was on TV. So Americans that were starting to tire of this war and think that we're, and we keep being told that we're winning this and we're going to be home soon uh, there. This does not look like it. And so the perception that was done by Americans, and this is where the idea that we're in a quagmire, okay, a bog, a swamp, we just can't get out uh, there. And every night what came on TV on the three major networks was this body count. count. You see the screenshot here where you see it looks like 338 or 35 um, Americans that are killed, the North Vietnamese and the, and the Viet Cong. Look, scoreboard, we win. But what happened was after year after year, day after day, month after month of this, Americans, the one number we saw was this number, which will eventually be over 58,000 Americans that die. Another thing that happened in 1968 was the Malay Massacre. Um, you see some of these pictures where children are, are shot. Um, Lieutenant Cowley orders his troops where they attack this village and shoot women and children. He was later reported by his subordinates. Um, and he will be convicted of these war crimes. But not only is that that bad with our relations with people in Viet Vietnam, but a lot of Americans saw this and say, what are we doing? Okay, are, are we even the good guys? And so there's 1968 will be when the majority of Americans will switch from being in support of us being in Vietnam to not being um, there. And again, asking, why are we there? Why are we halfway across the world um, as we go? Two terms you need to know with all wars is hawks and doves. Um, here, hawks are for war, doves are, are against it. For hawks in Vietnam, they were saying that we need to be there for that domino theory and against communism. Doves view this as a civil war. Okay, we're, we're involved in something, why are we trying to force the Vietnamese when many of the Vietnamese want to be communists, why are we trying to force them not to? A lot of the opposition, and we'll go a little bit more just later on, comes about because of the cost of money and lives. The greatest opposition is on college campuses. This might seem odd to you because they're not the ones fighting, but that was their friends that were there. We're going to see the average age of the soldiers 19 years old and what was happening with the drafts. After Tet uh, there, we will have, again, more people oppose it. Walter Cronkite, the pitcher of the sky, he was the most trusted American um, there. For several decades, Walter Cronkite came on TV. And the news at that time was not, not like how Rachel Maddow or Tucker Carlson is um, there. That's not news, that's their editorial shows um, there. But he would have a news program. Yes, it could be biased um, somewhat, but overall it would try not to be. But they would periodically be able to give their own editorial. And Walter Cronkite at the end of one of his shows in one of his own personal editorials where he said, this is my opinion, pretty much said after Tet that he, uh, that why are we here and was opposed to the war. Lyndon Johnson, when he heard that Cronkite had said that, said we've lost because once the Americans don't support it and if Walter Cronkite doesn't support it, the Americans aren't gonna support it uh, there. Lyndon Johnson, early in 1968, declines and says he's not going to accept the nomination. He wasn't going to get it anyways, but for the Democrats, where he could have ran for another term, he didn't. So he stepped out of the election um, there. Um, it'll be for the Democrats. Eventually, it looks like who the merchant person will be is Robert Kennedy, but he will be assassinated um, during this time um, in here. So 1968. Um, there, the Democrats will, will end up um, losing the election. The Republicans will win with Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon's plan was peace with honor. What is it? Well, it's peace with honor. No, he did not give details with it. If you remember for our other section, this is where for the domestic side with everything that was going on, it was law and order. So these two things would be the reason that his campaign reasons that we have. Now, once he became president, he actually had the idea of Vietnamization. The idea, which actually Johnson had already started, but more so with Nixon, that we are going to train the South Vietnamese and they will be trained to fight and we will be able to, to leave um, there. Um, as you can see by that cartoon on the bottom, which has been on the EOC before, it wasn't really something that we thought would work and it didn't work. And in all reality, we will use it again in Iraq um, there when President Obama will use the, that whole idea. 
uh, President Trump will will introduce the idea, and that's where we're right now, have a, a date to leave, although the Army soldiers have told President Biden that not to go buy it for, for the generals um, there, so it looks like we probably won't, but that's where um, history has repeated itself with it. But where we are supposedly getting out of Vietnam, we increased the bombing, and we're no longer just bombing in Vietnam, we're bombing in Laos and Cambodia. In 72, we increased even more bombing in there. Um, in North Vietnam will actually have a counterattack, so it doesn't look like they're getting weaker. And in 72, near the end of 72, we'll have the Christmas bombing. Something will happen that hap didn't happen before. We will have 15 of our B-52 bombers shot down which shows they're getting help either from the Soviets or China, but they're getting help militarily um, there because one thing we always had was air superiority um, here. Again, when you see victimization, that was the idea of training them. That was Nixon's plan here. You notice here the, scare, the scarecrow is definitely not scaring away the, 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 the crows on this. So, the end of the war. We will have the Paris Accords in 1973, which we withdraw from, Tom, from Vietnam. Um, as we withdraw, North Vietnam had promised that they, would, that they would not invade South Vietnam, and we promised South Vietnam that we would come to help them. If North Vietnam breaks it, neither happened um, there. The Civil War continues down in South Vietnam. Um, here and then in April of 1975 we will have in this famous picture here of the last helicopter where Americans will leave the embassy that line of people that stretches for a long ways are people that that support American and capitalism many of them that will not see um, the see much more of their life um, when the communists take over meanwhile we will have some boats that, that are out in the ocean and we will have thousands of boat people that will come and try to escape and this is where you see the different videos of the pushing off planes and things to get more room for the people um, in Orlando there's a community that started off of Highway 50 there that uh, and that that was of, of started by Vietnamese um, refugees that come um, here um, North, South Vietnam asked for our help and President Ford went to Congress but Congress was not going to get involved um, in there and this is the low point of our prestige um, throughout the world here. Um, this cartoon is kind of saying about for, for Nixon, yeah, we did um, 20,000 of our 58,000 that died um, were killed after he took over. All right, one thing that happened at the, for the end of the war here will be um, the Pentagon Papers are released. This is where there were documents that the government had that were leaked out. Um, the New York Times, the Washington Post were going to publish them. They both had to win lawsuits. Um, there that they were able to since it was said that um, they were safe for national security but since they were from before um, there that, that they were able to publish them. But a lot of people had suspected that the American government had not been honest and a lot of these papers will show the fact that things have been distorted and we were not being told the total truth on things that were happening in Vietnam um, here. Congress will react. In 1973 they will pass the War Powers Act. Um, here. This will make it where there's certain re regulations um, there. We'll reverse a lot of the Gulf of Tonkin resolution and take away the powers of the president of war. We don't know whether it's constitutional. This is something that we kind of look at more in government there because Article 1 says that Congress has the right to declare war. Article 2 has the president as commander in chief. So is one more powerful than another? What usually happens is whenever a president seems to be going too far, uh, on their, their own militarily, Congress starts waiving the War Powers Acts to use it as a check um, that they have. Um, Robert McNamara, Henry Kissinger will be in some other sections that we have. Robert McNamara will be one that will help redesign our military uh, to fight, and this is will continue on um, where he was Kennedy's um, Secretary of Defense, but continue on. A lot of the military we have today, when you think of the Special Forces like the Navy SEALs, a lot of that idea was we need these Special Forces to go against against these different insurgent groups um, that we have. Henry Kissinger is going to be a foreign advisor for multiple presidents during his time. He's the one that will make the, the Peace of Paris. I mentioned before, but this is the first televised war, and this is where we're getting one message from the government, but we're seeing other things. And like you see this award-winning picture here. Some people look at this and say, wait a minute, we're supporting this government that this um, Saigon official was executing on the street. Uh, uh, person. Meanwhile, what's happening in, in, on, on the streets in, the, in 1968, we have the Democratic primaries. 
in Chicago, um, where I show some of the video of what was happening in those. Uh, this is actually a pretty good little video for animated vi history of it. All right, for the soldiers. The average age in World War II was 27 years old, which is usually where you see that normally in 25, 26, 27, 28, 29 is usually when males are at their peak physical and mental condition. So that was our average age of our foot soldier in, in World War II. Um, very early on, most of our experienced soldiers served their tours and left Vietnam, and the average age of our soldier on the ground in Vietnam was 19. And of those soldiers, most of them um, were, were not um, very wealthy, and we're going to go over how, how, the, how the people with more money could get out of the draft. 10% um, of Americans were African Americans, but 20% of our soldiers on the ground were, were African Americans. We will have 58,000 killed, over 300,000 uh, majorly wounded. We're going to have PTSD, but it's going to be even worse in Vietnam than other wars because of the treatment that the soldiers got when they came back. They were not treated by heroes. Um, had a Vietnam veteran that was, that was speaking um, in one time and where he had talked about, he was told to make sure he changes out of his um, uniform before he gets off the plane. And he, and he arrived late at night, so he didn't think about doing that before he went home. He said the first thing he went to was in the restroom um, there when he got off the plane. And so he's off the plane for less than five minutes and he had a person that came up to him when he, sitting at, when he was standing at the urinal and they said baby killer and spit in his face. Again, that's why I say for PTSD, um, one thing I will be, I'm glad that for America that we learned is even it, when Americans opposed the war, like the Iraq war, we did not blame it on our soldiers um, there. But at that time we were, where they saw their fathers treated like heroes after World War II um, there, the Vietnam vets were not treated with respect and will, that will not happen for several decades um, there. MIA is missing in action, PIW, POWs are the prisoners of war, which we will have questions still over Florida. We, we, saw, we fly the, um, the POW MIA flag. All right, for some of the protests, and this is where for colleges we'll have this, um, SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, that's part of that new left that, that we had in the last section where the anti-Vietnam will join together with some of these other groups in a coalition. Their leader, you see Tom Hayden there on the right, um, and their statements for what they would have. They will have teach-ins. You've, you've, th you've heard of, of sit-ins, we had before, but the teach-ins, and they're trying to teach why, what's wrong with this for what we're in this war. Um, for Kent State, you see this picture down here um, that you see, famous picture for this girl um, after her friend has been, been shot. Um, now, the simple part of the story is we will have it where the National Guard fires in two two protesters, four killed and nine wounded. What usually isn't told is that a few days before that the ROTC building had, had, been, had been bombed. And all during that day, the, the soldiers where they had been thrown rocks and spit upon and every, everything else. And then, much like the Boston Massacre um, 200 years before with the British and Americans, a soldier, somehow or another, a shot is fired and then what ends up happening is this massacre um, that happens. Two days later, something similar happened in Jackson State. But this is where we, we have this. I mean, we're having this fighting with the protest on it. And realize, that's 1970, so the late 60s, 70s, and what we have going on, and we have the Civil Rights Movement and um, these things, environmental movement that we have. All right, for the draft, um, every, every war is trying to be a rich man's war, poor man's fight. Vietnam definitely shows it. You see this picture on the top, what ends up happening there is you have every date that is there. And then what they do is pull up the ping pong balls and it's numbered them for they have. So number one, they pull it out, it says October 25th. Number two, they pull it out, February 24th. Number three, April 12th. And as they go through, so your birth date is given a number. And then your local draft board will, will then go and they will call. And it may be that numbers one through 75 are to report by April 15th to the armory. And then you go through and you are processed. Some people will get their deferments. Then they will see, okay, we need more people. So number 76 through 150. So the higher the number you have, the less likely you are to, to be drafted um, here. So how do you legally get out of draft? There are people that avoided the draft um, in there, but there are people legally get out. Uh, one way was medical. If you have it where there is some documented medical reason why you can't go to it. To it. Um, here's where it's a lot of times it's famous for people for bone spurs um, that you have because if you have some traces of the calcium or a chip bone or something and um, I know personally that sometimes it can be real painful that you have. 
If you're at college, you can get a deferment, which is a great reason for you to make sure you didn't fail out of college or get in too much trouble. You could join the National Guard as the National Guard was not being sent overseas. You could move to another precinct. The thing about all these things is, if you had the money, you got more resources to do these things. But the poor didn't. That's why we disproportionately had a lot more for the poor. If, maybe if you didn't have money, if you could find a doctor that was against Vietnam, they maybe, again, find enough things or try to find something for you uh, that you have. We have a lot of people that avoided the draft and just moved out of the country. Moved to Canada and Sweden were two of the popular places. Uh, I've had a person second period ask, well, did any of them return? And yes, some did, but many of them never did return. And um, President Carter will give a pardon to those, just like it had been done in other wars. Truman had done that for those that avoided the draft in World War II um, that you have. Now here's some pretty famous people that um, had, had avoided the draft in one way or another. This young man is Donald Trump. He was able to get a deferment as he had bone spurs and he will have four times um, or four or five times with bone spurs. Um, this, this young man, that was Mitt Romney, um, the Republican candidate in 2012. Mitt Romney was able to get a deferment because he, he was on a missionary trip for two years where he was serving as a missionary as part of the Mormon religion. This young man is George W. Bush, future president. Um, president Bush will, will serve in the Air National Guard. Um, there. Now there are some questions even about his attendance and where the attendance sheets were lost. Some of the people in his company will say that he wasn't there. And his father, who was high up in the State Department, he got special favors. This young man here is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton will avoid it with college. He'll actually at one time when it looks like he's going to get drafted and go on for trying to get an ROTC to pay for, for school. And then when it looks so that he's not going to be drafted, he drops out of that. And next to him is Hillary Clinton or Hillary Rodham at that time, who was, who was involved in SDS that we had in the other parts for the notes. Now, one of our recent leaders that, that we had in the 2008 Republican candidate for president that definitely didn't shirk his duty was, was um, John McCain. And John McCain, who after he was shot down and made a prisoner um, there, he was the son of a U.S. admiral and would have been a huge um, person that, that could have gone if they could get him to, do, to say something against the United States. So he was tortured uh, there and will suffer a lot of things for multiple years. Had a chance to leave early because the United States arranged for it um, there, and he refused to leave before other people um, there. And this is where, again, it was a, a bit different than some of those others. Um, in our recent can't, um, election, this is one of the reasons why, where he's from Arizona, that we will have for the first time the state of Arizona vote Republican um, there. Because after, uh, while he was alive and then where he died soon there, President Trump was known to make comments about real heroes don't get caught and things like that and, and did not um, do as much for, about, um, for John McCain. And the, and the people of Arizona remember that uh, there. Now, reasons for opposition. For a lot of people, they say, why are we halfway across the world for people that want to be communists and we're trying to tell them not to be on there? It's a civil war. Other people looked at things and said, we're supporting one that's oppressive. Yeah, they're against communism, but they're corrupt. Um, you hear this, these next two statements a lot of times. The U.S. is not the world's police. We shouldn't have to go around other parts of the world. And the fact that just basically we shouldn't be fighting in war. And think about this time. This is the late 60s, early 70s. We will have a lot of problems with race um, in there. Our movements that are, are being made um, at that time. Later on, we were even going to have for a recession. So there's a lot of things going on at home. Uh, that we need to take take care of. All right, our counterculture movement. We kind of go through phases. It starts in the 50s with the Beatniks and the Haight-Ashbury District of San Francisco, the East Village in New York City. And it's going to grow with the Vietnam protests. And it's going to go from the flower children to the hippies. We're going to see this as we watch Forrest Gump and see what happens to Gen A um, there. But, but here's where we're going to have it. It's marked by the rock and roll uh, drugs. Um, and for some of the things for the communes, I'm going to go over stuff of communes also a little bit later. But this is where, it, and some of them say, well, what does it change? What's the difference between a flower ch child and a hippie? And where I showed a video for the 1968 music, they kind of tell where for the for the flower children, yeah, they may have used some marijuana, but they weren't going to use alcohol or cocaine or heroin. And the hippies is when it became more of a drug culture uh, there, and so. That's kind of declined. The sexual revolution is going to continue through the 70s and early 80s, but come to abrupt halt um, with AIDS on um, their time. But that counterculture movement. 
And that counterculture movement, the Vietnam protests, they're all kind of intermixed with the music um, here. We're going to have our Vietnam protest songs, and we're going to have these folk songs that, that are, are there. And these singers, Joan Baez, Janis Joplin, all right, that are going to be singing these ballads and singing things against the Vietnam War. Um, one thing you can kind of look at is watch and see how the Beatles over time, they go from these clean cut boys in the 50s until you see like this picture later on and you kind of see that, wow, they do look like hippies. But even where, like when they released the White Album um, there and the revolution and, and some of the changes that, that you have um, there. Um, Woodstock. Woodstock is really famous. Um, a whole lot of people say they're Woodstock. Um, not near as many people were at Woodstock that said they were um, there. When you do your interviews, doesn't mean if they said they were at Woodstock that they weren't there. But a lot of people, they, they may have been at a different music festival like Woodstock, and they may not have even known the difference um, here. But it's a lot of times it's um, made very idealistic, um, and we will have for the music and a lot of stars that were there at this time. But it also, there were there were uh, uh, quite a few people that died, and the number of women that were raped during the time of Woodstock's a lot of times um, basically glossed over here. And what will end up happening is we're going to have the Altamont Festival in, in San Francisco. That will be even worse with this. So it wasn't quite so idealistic. But this is where the music is intertwined in the idea that, that you have. But um, that's why I like to show that, that video, music video for 1968. And part of what they say is that um, they said, well, some of the musicians realize that, yeah, they can't change the world when they look back upon that time um, that you have.